Super creative. As far back as I can remember, I wanted to be an astronaut. It didn't happen, but it's never too late to reach for the stars. Welcome to Observatory, where we embark on adventures in space! The moon and the planet today. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. I got a bad feeling about this. I'm Rob Lyons, and you're watching Rob Observatory here on the Super Creative Channel. And I'm just about to set up for a night of astrophotography and thought that this would be a good time to do a review on my Skywatcher AZ GTI telescope mount. This is quite possibly the cheapest and lightest go-to mount that you can find on the market today. And this is my own independent review of the mount. I don't have any affiliation with Skywatcher or any of its retailers. I paid full price for this and I intend to actually use it for astrophotography. I didn't get this with the intent of making content or a review video. The reason why I bought this mount was that I was previously using the Star Adventurer Pro and I live in this Bortle 9 zone, as you can see here. So when I make images, I have to do them over multiple nights. And I was getting extremely frustrated with trying to star hop and match the same composition of my shots night after night, especially when the target was directly overhead at the zenith. I had to get down on the ground and adjust the telescope. And it was extremely awkward, fairly painful, to be honest. So. One night, after a ton of frustration, I jumped online and I started looking for the cheapest, lightest uh, go-to mount that I could find so that I wouldn't have to go through these frustrations night after night. Now, if you hang out to the end of this video, I'm going to show you my first light image. It's the Elephant Trunk Nebula, and it's one of my personal favorites. So let's just get onto the mount here. The AZ GTI is actually an alt azimuth mount. Uh, altitude azimuth mount, and it's originally intended for visual and maybe a little bit of lunar and planetary photography, but Skywatcher has actually released some firmware that allows it to be used in equatorial mode, and therefore we can use this for astrophotography. Now I've never used it in alt as mode, but never say never, I do like um, visual astronomy sometimes, so I may convert it after upgrading, we'll see how it goes. So this mount comes in at about 2.6 pounds on the mount head here. The tripod weighs about 7.9 pounds. So together it's barely over 10 pounds. You can run this off of DC power or AA batteries. And the mount features Wi-Fi connectivity for pairing with the SynScan app on your smartphone or tablet. You can also connect it to a hand controller or use an EQ mod cable to pair it with either your computer or maybe something like the ASI Air Pro. Of course, all this connectivity allows for one of its main features, which is an extremely accurate go-to feature. So you can find your favorite targets with a simple tap on your smartphone screen and away you go. That same EQ mod cable uh, for using with your computer, it also allows the mount to be used with auto guiding for much longer exposures. This mighty mount can support a max payload of about 11 pounds, but I've seen people go a bit over that and still get great results, and I think I'm probably pushing that right now as well. So of course your mileage may vary. At 475 US dollars, this is the smallest, lightest, and most affordable EQ mount that you're probably going to find. I have invented a new category for this style of mount. Instead of grab and go, I'm calling this grab and go to. Normally, you would only see this size, price, and weight in something like a Star Tracker, not an EQ mount. So, I also want to mention that Skywatcher has recently produced the Star Adventurer GTI, and we're going to discuss that mount later on in this video. I purchased this mount because my payload's small. It's a little over eight pounds, and I image from up here in my top yard. So, I carry my rig up a couple flights of stairs from my studio down below. Making something small and light like this absolutely ideal. I actually carry this entire rig fully assembled in one hand. It's not bad, right? So if you like to go out to a dark site uh, away from where you live, something like this small mount with uh, AA battery operation would be perfect for those sessions because of its extreme portability. Size and price really do equate to good value on the AZ GTI. Let's talk about how we get this little bad boy running in EQ mode for astrophotography. The first thing that we're going to need is completely invisible. It's a firmware update. I'm running version 3.2, which is an older version. 
I did upgrade it and I had some auto guiding issues as did others. So I ended up downgrading back to 3.2 and that solved the issue. So 3.2 will get the job done. It's a version that I recommend that you start with. Next, you're gonna need a wedge. Now, if you already have something like the Star Adventurer Pro bundle, you could use the wedge from that. In my case, I've upgraded to the William Optics High Latitude Wedge, and it's a worthy investment, and it makes polar alignment so much smoother, and it's remarkably easier, and it makes precise adjustments absolutely easy during the night. Now, if your budget allows, I highly recommend doing this upgrade, and not just for the AZ GTI, this is actually a great upgrade for your Star Tracker as well. Next up, we're gonna need a counterweight and a counterweight rod. Again, if you have the Star Adventurer bundle, you could just use the rod and the counterweight from that. But the threading is a little bit different and thus requires an adapter. You're gonna need an M8 to M12 adapter as the GTI has female M12 threads. Also, double check that yours is threaded as some of these have shipped without any threads inside the mount. In my case, I had a spare counterweight kit from the Star Adventurer so I actually ordered the thread adapter, but they sent me the wrong one. And I couldn't find the right one quickly enough, so I went to Home Depot and bought a large bolt, some nuts, and a few washers, and I actually just dropped it through the top of the mount and went DIY on this. I'll link the Star Adventure counterweight kit and the correct thread adapter in the description below, because I think that's actually the most elegant solution, and you get the bar and the counterweight together with the kit when you purchase it. So it's pretty affordable, and there is actually a third option available now. It's a dedicated M12 counterweight bar. It's being offered online. I have one on order, and I'll swap this out for that one when it arrives, but it's probably gonna take a while considering logistics and uh, all the shipping problems we're having still here in 2022. If you're wondering how I anodized uh, my bolt and some of my red accessories, it's a metal cast paint by Duplicolor and it does a good job of matching metallic silver parts with all your ZWO or maybe William Optics kind of red anodized gear. These smaller 100 gram counterweights are for a camera gimbal and I just picked them up on Amazon. They're really handy to fine tune your counterweight balance and you can stack as many of them as you want. They just screw into each other with typical threads. All right, so we have our firmware installed, we have our counterweight all set up. Now all we need to do is connect the mount to our imaging controller of choice. In my case here, I'm running an ASI Air Pro by ZWO, and I'm making the connection with an EQ mod cable. I got my EQ mod cable from First Light Optics, and it works perfectly. That's all we have to do to convert this mount from Alt-AZ to Equatorial. From here, the process is exactly the same for shooting astrophotos as it is with any other go-to mount. Now, I don't use the SynScan app on my phone that pairs with this mount. I only run it off the ASI Air Pro, which I also use to perform my polar alignments and my go-tos. Now, this mount is absolutely easy to align in this matter, despite not having any form of polar finder or scope in its design. The go-tos, or pointing, are extremely accurate, and the meridian flips are trouble-free. Everything has been all roses and candy so far in this review, so let's discuss some of the challenges I've actually faced with this mount. Auto-guiding is where we're gonna face our main problem. When you run calibration steps for this mount, you'll notice that on the RA axis, everything goes perfectly smooth. But when you get into the declination steps, the mount has a lot of trouble stepping back to the original position. There is a gargantuan amount of backlash in this mount, especially on the declination axis. Now, I know many people online have taken theirs apart in order to improve them, but I'm not really confident enough in my own abilities to do that, and it might be a miracle if I get it put back together and working again. So despite the backlash and those issues, I actually get really excellent guiding when the conditions are favorable, and favorable meaning when there's not too much wind and when the seeing's pretty good. My total RMS, it usually falls between 0.7 and 1.4 on average. I've seen it lower, I've seen it higher, but anything under two arc seconds on this setup gives me perfectly round stars at 300 seconds guided exposures. So as long as the wind doesn't pick up, it gets the job done just fine. I can't go any longer than that. I tried seven minutes, I tried 10 minutes, and it's never worked. But sticking with five minutes gives me consistently good results. 
My scope is 250 millimeter focal length and my camera has a one inch sensor. So that's the equivalent of 675 millimeters on a full frame. With longer focal lengths than this, you'd probably have to shorten up your exposure time. And with a wider focal length setup, I think you could probably go longer than that. Now I'm a professional photographer, so everything makes sense to me in sensor size and focal length. But you'll mostly hear astro uh, photographers, astronomers, and maybe engineers talk about uh, field of view and arc minutes and the aperture of the telescope. That means more to them when they're considering how to compose an image. So uh, apologies for my kind of different way of measuring these optics. I'm just a photographer through and through for 20 years and that's the way I see things. So final thoughts. Is this mount worth it? It's a lot harder to say in 2022, especially seeing things like the Star Adventure GTI on the market, which is a fusion of the Star Adventure and this AZ GTI. It is more expensive, but purpose-built for astrophotography, it doesn't require any modification, all these accessories and workarounds. If it were on the market when I was buying, I definitely would have bought that instead. I think it's the far better option. That is, of course, if you can actually get your hands on one, it's virtually impossible to find right now. Now, if you already have an AZ GTI, or maybe you see one on the used market, I think it could be a great value proposition given its low price. You do, however, have to be a bit careful because many people have reported inconsistencies with the quality control on the build of this mount. Now, mine works perfectly, but I've heard a lot of reports of others not working so well. So you are taking a bit of a chance, a roll of the dice when purchasing the AZ GTI. So my final recommendation is just to go with the Star Adventurer GTI. I think it's the more reliable option, especially if you can afford it. Um, you could also look at something like a strain wave or harmonic mount, and they're just as portable. They can handle a lot more weight. They don't require balancing or counterweights, and their guiding is actually more accurate. But their price puts them in a completely different category than a grab and go to equatorial like the GTIs. Let's take a look at this mount's first light image, the Elephant Trunk Nebula. This is a mix of interstellar gas and dust in the area of IC 1396. You can find it 2400 light years from Earth in the constellation Cepheus. Astronomers believe the central cavity has been carved out by the formation of new stars and the resulting winds and pressures that are a byproduct of that process. The trunk itself is a mix of gas and dust located in front of the cavity, which is what gives it this dramatic contrast that you see here. This is a result of stacking five minute exposures shot on a monochromatic cooled astronomy camera through seven nanometer narrowband filters over six nights in September for a grand total of 23 hours of exposure. That is one of my favorite targets to shoot. And I just got some three nanometer filters and I'm shooting the same target again tonight and I'm hoping to compare the two to see how they stack up. So look out for that video coming very soon. That's gonna do it for this episode of Rob Observatory. The stars belong to everyone. So get out there and see for yourself. This broadcast of Observatory has been brought to you by the Super Creative Corporation. Super Creative. Woo!